The God of Shinobi, a name so intimidating that it should definitely only be given to one person. Right? No, because even though the God of Shinobi is one of the hardest nicknames in not only Naruto, but all of anime, it has in some way or another been given to three separate characters in Naruto. Those characters being in an ascending order of strength, Hiruzen, Hashirama, and Hagoromo, the three H's of the apocalypse. And somewhat ironically, the way they're set up strength-wise is also the way that they're chronologically given the nickname the God of Shinobi. Because Hiruzen is the first person to don that nickname, while Hashirama is the second, and Hagoromo is the third. But out of all of these three, who is truly the most deserving of that title? Well, uh... Unfortunately, it's Hagoromo. As Hagoromo is the father of the modern shinobi, as him giving ninja to every living being on Earth was the reason that humanity was able to crack the code of Chuck for themselves, and after his death, he ascended to go exist in his own dimension and now is infinitely powered by the Pure Lands, which is essentially Naruto Heaven, making him, in actuality, the the god of shinobi but that doesn't fit with the narrative i'm trying to build today and it's my channel and therefore for the sake of today's video the real person out of those three that deserves to be called the god of shinobi is hashirama one of the most important and beloved characters in the entirety of the naruto universe the original inheritor of asura's will so far as we know obviously there was reincarnations prior to him but that's a giant blank period that we know nothing about the original user and probably greatest user of wood release we've ever seen the tamer of eight of the nine tailed beasts the founder of Konoha, and yes, the true god of Shinobi, Hashirama. I realized recently, even though Hashirama is in my top five favorite characters in the entirety of the Naruto and Boruto universes, that I've never made a video strictly dedicated to him. I've talked about whether he was a slug sage or a sun sage. I've talked about how his wood release could be tied to divine trees, but I've never once done a you know nothing on him and as hashirama is well and truly the main character of the naruto universe in my heart i figured we should rectify that issue because today we're talking you know nothing about hashirama but before we get to breaking down the life story of the man with the prettiest hair in the entirety of the naruto universe ladies and gentlemen please for me like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. But before we get into all that, today we're going to talk about our favorite recurring sponsor to the page, Factor. Factor is an absolute must for you this summer, as Factor allows you to fuel up fast on dietitian approved absolutely delicious meals that only take two minutes to get ready. And in these warm, sunny months, as some of us emerge from our winter caves, the idea of being stuck in grocery stores or the kitchen cooking up lunch or dinner is just not the play. But Factor offers so much more than just these delicious dietitian approved and never frozen meals, as they also offer snacks, smoothies, and so much more. They provide you with a wide variety of easy options for your day, whether that be breakfast, midday bites, or anything else. And let me just tell you, Factor plays a massive role in my life. As somebody who runs three YouTube channels and is in the process of making a fourth, I don't have hours to spend thinking about what I'm gonna eat and preparing it. But at the same time, fitness and health is massively important to me, which is why Factor's fresh, never frozen, dietitian approved and delicious meals are huge for me. But there's a big difference between telling and showing. So let's head down to the kitchen and show you just how delicious these meals are. Today we're making some creamy Parmesan chicken. And making a factor meal is as easy as taking that slide off, poking a couple of holes in our foil here, and throwing this meal in the microwave for a grand total of two minutes. And now for the all important taste test. Mm. Somehow that chicken is still incredibly juicy. It's well seasoned. It's perfect. Head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code NCHAMMER2350 to get 50% off your first factor box and 20% off your next month of orders. That's code NCHAMMER2350 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month of orders. It's time to take back your time. And if you're feeling particularly generous and want to hear me talk about other anime and manga that aren't Naruto and Boruto, go ahead and follow my other YouTube channel. The Weeb Commander. Or if you want to see me try to bring real life challenges to the anime world, go ahead and follow the brand new project that I created with Stephen Heat, Chris Barnett, and Danny Mata called Anime IRL. Or if you want to hear me talk about anime and manga, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, Talk is Anonymous, where me and Danny Mata break down everything that happened in anime and manga this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. So, Hashirama Senju, the head of the Senju clan, the first Hokage, the defeater of Madara, the man who unified the Senju and the Uzumaki, captured Kurama, and married its first Jin Cherokee. Well, Hashirama may not be the most present or prevalent character in Naruto, he undoubtedly has one of the biggest impacts out of anybody. An impact that far outshines men who are considered of equal importance like Hiruzen or Topi Rama, a man who shaped the ninja world almost as much as the previous inheritor of the title of the God of Shinobi, 
Hagoromo, which would make sense as he was the reincarnation of Hagoromo's favorite son. But while many people know the accomplishments of Hashirama, they don't know the character. And thus today, that's what I want to elucidate. Today, I want to walk you through Hashirama's life and make it clear and obvious as to why he did the things that he did. Why he caught the tailed beasts. Why he offered them to the other villages. Why even he died. And therefore, we're going to start this video off in the way that we tend to start these kinds of videos off at the beginning. See, Hashirama was born during the Warring States period, a drudgingly long and bloody time period that existed between the death of Asura and Indra and the creation of the ninja villages. During the Warring States period, the countries of the Naruto continent were uniformly small, and each and every single one of these small countries would battle against each other constantly for land, power, and food. And as these small countries squabbled with each other and tried to maintain as much power as possible, they would, instead of keeping armies of their own, hire on mercenary ninja clans. Meaning during these time periods, any clan of ninjas were mercenaries whose loyalties were purchased by the highest bidder. But because there were so many small countries trying to push on the borders and resources of other small countries, war was constant. It's why it's called the Warring States period. And in fact, war and turmoil and desolation was so constant that during the 1,000 or so year long Warring States period, the average lifespan was only 30 years. This was because during this time period, children were treated no differently from the adults. From the moment, in any capacity whatsoever, you could hold a weapon, you were on the battlefield. And thus, after battles between mercenary clans waging wars over fertile land for small countries, the battlefields where those fights were fought would be strewn with the bodies of dead would-be ninjas, as these children would often come into combat against more elderly and more skilled combatants. And because ninja allegiances were purchasable, but the horrors they would inflict on countries was as real as if they were doing it for any other reason, ninjas during this time period wouldn't divulge their family names. Because even though they weren't destroying these countries with any malice in their heart, the gore and destruction left in the wake of their conquest was all the same. And amongst all of this warring, two clans rose to the top the Senju, known for their diversity of combat abilities, and the Uchiha, known for their Sharingan. But because of just how much more powerful the Senju and the Uchiha were than all the other possible ninja clans for hire, if a small country wanted to invade another small country, they would hire either the Senju or the Uchiha. But because the only way to battle against the Senju or the Uchiha was the Senju or the Uchiha, the opposing country would simply hire the clan that the other country didn't. Which meant that over the course of the Warring States period, time and time again, the Senju and the Uchiha were pitted against against each other in combat through no control of their own, simply because they were fulfilling a contract to do what they did best fight. The era in which Hashirama was born into was no different. See, even though Hashirama was the person to end the Warring States period, that doesn't mean the segment of the Warring States period he was born into was any less brutal and violent than the one that his father, Butsuma Senju, was born into. And thus, Hashirama, born as the eldest of Butsuma Senju's sons, was born into war, and Hashirama was born the eldest of four sons. See, because while everybody remembers Tobirama, the second Hokage of Konoha, many forget that Hashirama had two other brothers, Kawarama and Itama, both of whom were younger than Tobirama. And thus these four sons grew up on the battlefield, waging war against, most commonly, the Uchiha. However, this doesn't mean that the entirety of Hashirama's life was dedicated to war. Hashirama and the Senju weren't hired all the time. While yes, the Warring States period was wrought with war, the ferocity with which ninja clans would battle against each other usually would wrap up wars between two warring ninja clans rather quickly. And thus Hashirama did find himself with infrequent downtime. And it was during this time that Hashirama met a boy roughly his age, named Madara. Now, because it was custom during this time period that ninjas didn't reveal their last names, neither Hashirama nor Madara knew that they came from warring clans, because neither of them knew if the other belonged to a small country that was pillaged by their respective ninja clans. And these two boys, not knowing that their clans are pitted against each other in death battles every other week, became rivals and would compete against each other in trivial, childlike games, like skipping stones and seeing who can urinate furthest into a river. And more often than not, 
Hashirama would come out victorious. And in between these games that they would play with each other, they would have conversations about the world and how it was playing out in a way that they didn't agree with. See, because both Hashirama and Madara were older brothers. And while Madara's family was substantially smaller than Hashirama's, as he only had one sibling in Izuna, they would frequently talk about how they don't want children on the battlefield. And this right here is the through line that draws Madara and Hashirama together. Not the fact that they're Indra and Asura's reincarnations, no, the fact that they're the eldest sons of prominent families. See, Hashirama and Madara both had something to protect, and that something to protect was their younger siblings who were forced to fight in a battle that wasn't done for loyalty or for a just cause, but money. See, in this way, both Hashirama and Madara realized that the most powerful entities on Earth, the clans that are being hired to wage the wars for these small villages, are for some reason bowing to these smaller villages. They take the crumbs that these smaller countries wipe off their plate, and they say, thank you very much. I'll send my children to die for you now. Think about that. Think about that for one second. These countries, too weak to fight their own battles, are paying ninja clans to fight it for them. And these ninja clans, like the Senju and the Uchiha, are so strapped to have enough fighters to participate in these high-level battles against the other clan, like the Uchiha or the Senju, that they need to send out truly their youngest members. And thus the Uchiha and the Senju are stuck in a perpetual eagle death dive where they have to match each other in strength because they're constantly being pitted against each other. Ironically, they're suffering from success. See, because if you're not known as the strongest ninja clan of all time, you're not constantly waging war against the other strongest ninja clan of all time. Think about the Yamanakas, or the Saratobis, or the Shimoras, all clans that existed during this time period. However, if they were hired to protect a smaller country, the other country wouldn't feel the need to hire the Uchiha or the Senju, and thus these smaller ninja clans wouldn't have to fight these ridiculously high-level battles. They could use their older ninjas. They wouldn't have to thrust their children onto the battlefield. And all of this is coming from greed, essentially. See, because if these ninja clans teamed up with each other, they would be stronger than any of these smaller countries. And yet because of existing grudges and the fact that they all need money to live, they would consistently send their own children to the slaughter to make sure that they get a slice of the bread that these smaller countries are providing. And if you understand that, the true political maneuvering happening in the Warring States period, you can begin to understand where Madara and Hashirama deviated in mentality. See, because it wasn't really until Hashirama's two youngest brothers, Kawarama and Itama died, that Tobirama had a sit down with Hashirama and said, this system doesn't work. Yeah, a lot of people give Hashirama the credit for devising a system that would get children off the battlefield. But in actuality, it was Tobirama. See, Hashirama and Madara were stuck in the same mentality until Tobirama's interference. They were both essentially becoming their fathers, using the grudges of lost love loved ones to pit their anger towards another ninja clan. And in essence, that's exactly what all these smaller countries would want. For these ninja clans to get in petty squabbles with each other, strip loved ones from each other, and therefore they only focus their hatred and vitriol at each other. And if you can't understand that I'm talking about our worlds right now, unclog your ears. The countries pit the things they know are more powerful than them against each other so that they never look up. It's why the two-party system was created, but you didn't hear that from me. They generate hot-button issues like gun control and abortion, and then they stoke those flames and separate America in half so we spend more time looking at each other than at them, and then they bask in the billions and billions of dollars they're able to liquidate from our taxes and live like fat pigs while the rest of us die in squalor. I mean... Warring States period. <laughs> My bad, I have no idea what happened. Blacked out for a second there. This G Fuel's got me feeling wild. Burned down Blackrock. Oh <laughs> God, what was that? In Minecraft for legality. But anyways, like I said, it's not until the death of Kuarama and Itama that the Senju brothers, deeply under the provocation of Tobirama, decide it's time for a new system. However, the creation of this new system would require an alliance between the Senju and the Uchiha, as individually the Senju and the Uchiha would not be strong enough on their own to unify all of the small nations. And this was an idea that Madara slowly but surely opened up to. See, because while Madara didn't have a Tobirama in his corner talking about how the child 
childhood deaths on the battlefield were an atrocity, Madara had a Toby Rama on the battlefield who chowed him. That childhood deaths on the battlefield are an atrocity. However, the unfortunate aspect of all of this is that that didn't have to happen. See, while Toby Rama and Hashirama wanted unity between the Uchiha and the Senju, this only came after Itama's death. But it was prior to Itama's death that Toby Rama, his father, Madara's father, and Izuna broke up their friendship, revealing to Hashirama and Madara that they had always been enemies. And thus Itama and Izuna's death are spurned on by a lack of understanding early on in Madara and Hashirama's relationship. But the resolution that Madara and Hashirama come to after the death of their brothers is vastly different. See, because like I've already stated, while Hashirama had Tobirama in his corner to say that the system needs to be turned upside down and to do that, the Senju and the Uchiha need to come together. Madara, who has an Uchiha brain, which means that he loves more than anybody else on Earth and that love leads him to hatred, wanted to exact revenge on Tobirama and Hashirama for taking Isina from him. And this is where the ideologies of Hashirama and Madara begin to differ. See, because even after discovering the identity of Madara, Hashirama Hashirama wanted to find a way in which the two of them could live together peacefully as friends. And therefore Hashirama put the duty thrust onto him as a Senju aside, which was to kill Madara, the future head of the Uchiha clan. However, Madara, who believed that a world where the two of them could live peacefully was impossible, ended their friendship so that Madara could kill Hashirama without reservation. And thus, for almost a decade, Madara and Hashirama resumed their clashes. However, a constant misconception is that over the course of this rough decade that they were battling is that Hashirama and Madara were fighting to a standstill. That is not what was happening. Like I said, their ideas on how they wanted to approach the future deviated at that point prior to their decade of fighting against each other as the new heads or current heads of their respective clans. Hashirama did not want to kill Madara and was afforded many opportunities to do it but could never make himself do it. And Madara over the course of all these fights was never able to overcome Hashirama's superior abilities. And then one day when they did both actually become the heads of their clans, the Senju clan under Hashirama thrived. See, what nobody talks about all that often is the fact that the Warring States period only really came to an end because the Senju won. See, under Hashirama's leadership, the Senju got stronger, and like a lot stronger. While the Uchiha under Madara's leadership didn't necessarily get weaker, but didn't get as strong as the Senju. And thus the Senju started stacking a couple of very crucial wins. When in the past, most of the battles between the Uchiha and the Senju were a coin flip. And thus the Uchiha started to buckle under the weight of the power of the Senju. And it only got worse until eventually in a battle between the Uchiha and the Senju, both Madara and Izuna were at Tobirama and Hashirama's mercy. However, Hashirama, like before, couldn't find the resolve to kill his friend. And thus, once again, he tried to plead with Madara to unite their two clans, to make their childhood dream a reality. However, Izuna, who at this time had been critically injured by Toby Rama, convinced Madara to retreat, and Hashirama allowed for their retreat like he had done so many times before. However, Hashirama, identifying that the will of the Uchiha was weak, sent a ceasefire agreement to the Uchiha camp, and the majority of the Uchiha wanted to accept this ceasefire. However, because the wound that was inflicted on Izuna Izuna by Tobirama proved to be fatal, Madara rejected the ceasefire agreement. In this segment of time right here, I find to be the most interesting time in both Hashirama and Madara's lives. Because remember what we identified at the beginning of this video. The core motivations of both Hashirama and Madara is the fact that they were older brothers. And as the eldest in a family of brothers that would be forced to battle on endless battlefields, they would often dream about a world where children would not have to participate in the squabbles of adults. Though at the same time, prior Prior to Toby Rama swaying Hashirama's feelings and then subsequently rescinding those feelings and re entering into combat against the Uchiha, the both of them still held a massive amount of resentment for the other's clan. And that's why we can sit here and give all the credit in the world to Hashirama for trying to find peace in his battle against Madara. Inherently, he's in a different situation than Madara. See, because Hashirama is able to apply his core motivation until the end of the Warring States period. In fact, he's able to apply that core motivation until the end of his own life because Toby Rama out outlives him. Not by that much, but outlives him nonetheless. And thus, who's to say that Hashirama would have made such a gigantic push for peace if Toby Rama was the one who died instead of Izuna? Tie this into the fact that Hashirama was doing the negotiations from a position of power, as after Izuna's death, a fair amount of the Uchiha actually defected to the side of the Senju because they knew they were on the losing side of the war, and we can't necessarily deify Hashirama for his actions during the Warring States period. In all measurable aspects, he was negotiating from a position of power. That's what 
what I find so interesting. Most people don't come to that conclusion. Most people just assume that Hashirama is like Naruto, a godlike figure who walks around on water as the purveyor of all truth and faith. A character who would turn the other cheek in all given scenarios just because he didn't want to kill his friend. But that's not necessarily the truth. While technically he did lose more siblings than Madara during the war, he came out of the war with siblings. And thus Madara, who was racked with grief, deciding to make one final stand against the Senju after the death of Izuna, just to be defeated by them because the clan was the weakest they had ever been, cannot be looked at through the lens, at least in my eyes, through the medium of good guy versus bad guy. But this final battle only gets infinitely more interesting when you consider the fact that Toby Rama wants to kill Madara at the end of this fight. But Hashirama stops him, asserting that Toby Rama killing Madara would just reignite tensions between the Senju and the Uchiha. But that's probably not true. See, because outside of the core motivation of Hashirama simply trying to protect his siblings, he also doesn't want to lose his childhood friend in Madara. And while Tobirama cutting down Madara might have reignited tensions between the Uchiha and the Senju, the majority of the Uchiha were either dead or had already defected to the Senju. And in just a couple of years, the Uchiha would actively push Madara out of their community because he was trying to dissent against the Senju. And thus, we really have to look at Hashirama as less of a politician and more as a protector of the things he loves. But not killing Madara can also just as easily be looked at through the lens of turning the other cheek. But I actually don't give Hashirama that much credit here because he just didn't want to kill his friend. See, while well, it can obviously be tied up in the bow of politicking and trying to unite the Senju and the Uchiha clans, and Madara is a crucial piece to that pie, I don't think it's that complicated. Because in this moment, Hashirama isn't necessarily thinking about him and Madara bringing the clans together. Which is why when Madara says, take your own life for the death of Izuna, Hashirama says, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Toborama, lead the clan. See you later. Which shows that in some way or another, Hashirama's plans didn't even really include himself. So long as at least some of his siblings and his friend made it through the Warring States period, he was fine with that. Even though the original plan that he made with Madara and Toborama was for Madara and Hashirama to come together and bring the clans together. Something that he should have understood probably wouldn't have happened without him there. As Toborama and Madara don't necessarily see eye to eye because they are very similar. However, before Hashirama is able to end his own life, Madara stops him and is moved by the gesture, and therefore Madara agrees on peace. And thus the Senju and the Uchiha and all the affiliated clans like the Saratobi and the Shimura come together and create a village, a village of peace, a village founded on the principle that children would no longer have to die in combat. Konoha, and they do this by effectively being a force so incredibly strong that it unifies all of the small nations in a certain area that later becomes known as the Land of Fire. And then they, as a unified force of clans, create an army that is governed by the Hokage, as the Hokage Naruto is supposed to act kind of like the Shogun in Edo period Japan, while the country itself is ruled over by a daimyo, though the daimyo only controls the Shogun and not necessarily the army. The daimyo is more like a financial leader of the country. Any and all money in the form of taxes or crops go to the daimyo, and that money is used to fund armies like the one controlled by the Kages. However, much like with nuclear arms races, other small countries saw that the Land of Fire had formed and realized not only, oh, us ninja clans can come together and unify all these smaller countries, but also, if we don't, uh, Konoha is going to take over the entire world. And thus, without Hashirama sparing Madara and creating Konoha, the world probably would have continued to exist as smaller countries, roughly the size as the land hidden in the Rain. However, now that Konoha was founded, Hashirama accepted the fact that it needed a leader. And Hashirama, who I'd like to once again remind you is not a politician, decided the best person to lead Konoha would have been Madara. And boy oh boy, was he wrong? Well, that uh, he was wrong and he wasn't. See, because if Madara had been selected as Hokage, the blight of the Uchiha probably would have stopped, as it would have been established early on that the Uchiha were valued in Konoha as a whole. And if the Uchiha were placed in a valuable position in the early parts of Konoha, they couldn't have been relegated gated into positions like police officers by Topirama, and they probably never would have ended up in the Uchiha massacre in the first place. Though, Konoha would have probably immediately waged war against any and all other villages, and they probably would have won, though it would have been incredibly bloody and violent and probably counterproductive in the long run of things. However, fortunately, before Hashirama was able to snap his fingers and make Madara Hokage, Tobirama said, let's put it up to a vote. And once again, Hashirama, who was controlling a larger force that was persistent in Konoha, was democratically elected the Hokage. Now, while one can absolutely sit here and say, oh, Hashirama is just more likable, that's why he won the first Hokage seat, I'd like to remind you that Konoha was founded by the Senju and the Uchiha, and at this time, the 
Ren Ji were not only more prosperous, but more powerful. On top of this, some of the first clans that came to Konoha were the Sarutobi and the Shimura, two clans that pledged their loyalty to the Senju. And therefore, when it came down to a democratic vote, Madara didn't really stand a chance, and Toburama probably knew this. However, as Hashirama wasn't a politician, he probably didn't. And this is why when Hashirama was elected as Hokage, he wants Madara to work with him as a brother, as his right-hand man, to effectively work as a pseudo-leader of the villagers he's now brought together as villagers. One of Hashirama's key goals as the first Hokage was to rise the Uchiha standing in Konoha, because Hashirama wanted Madara to succeed him as the second Hokage. However, Madara deluded himself into believing that Toby Rama was gonna be the second Hokage, and while technically he wasn't wrong, it was mostly because of what Madara did. See, like I've already established, Hashirama wanted Madara to be the second Hokage. He technically wanted him to be the first Hokage, and Hashirama, as the first Hokage, has the power to elect the second Hokage. However, because Madara convinced himself that the Uchiha clan's power was being diminished, and that Toby Rama was gonna be elected as the second Hokage, and because he was manipulated by the alteration of the stone tablet by Black Zetsu, Madara, after only a couple of of years decided that Konoha was a failed experiment and tried to galvanize the Uchiha to abandon it, intent on basically restarting the Warring States period, however that wouldn't work. Madara at best would be able to galvanize the Uchiha clan to abandon Konoha, and at worst, wouldn't be able to galvanize anybody, and the worst came to fruition. And thus over the course of the next couple of years, time and time again, Madara attacked Konoha by himself. And time and time again, Hashirama had to spare Madara. And the true irony of all this is that the reason that Madara and Hashirama couldn't live peacefully together was not Hashirama or Konoha being a failed experiment, it was Madara being manipulated and believing that the Uchiha clan was going to be suppressed, when in actuality it was his actions that led to the Uchiha clan being suppressed. See, Hashirama wanted to place Madara in a position where he would secede him as the next Hokage. And if Madara had simply stayed in in Konoha and ruled by the side of Hashirama, not only would the Uchiha clan status have risen in the eyes of those who lived in Konoha, but Madara's status would have risen in equal stature. However, because Madara dedicated the rest of his first life to terrorizing Konoha and eventually capturing Kurama and using him in a faded battle against Hashirama, what Madara did was effectively make the Uchiha clan look like a warmongering group of people who had the ability to control a terrifying force of power in Kurama. Kurama, which led the majority of the village and Hiruzen to believe that when Konoha was attacked by Kurama just 50 or so years after Madara had tried to do it against Hashirama, that inevitably the reason that it was happening was the Uchiha. But without the idea that the Uchiha were capable of doing this in the first place because of Madara, the Uchiha probably wouldn't have been looked at with so much vitriol when Kurama attacks the second time. And thus, while a lot of people, Hashirama included, try to throw the blame of the Uchiha being suppressed in Konoha on Tobirama or Hiruzen when it really boils down to it, it's Madara's fault. And Madara pays for that mistake dearly. As in the final battle that Hashirama and Madara have that's so intense it creates the Valley of the End, where Madara pulls off things like the first ever majestic attire Susano, Hashirama multiple times over the course of this battle pleads with Madara to stop. However, Madara refuses to stop the battle and continues to fight until he's too tired to maintain his Sharingan, at which point Hashirama is able to trick Madara with a wood clone and stab him in the back, effectively killing Madara. And it's in this moment that once again, Hashirama's hand was forced by Madara. See, because this battle was massive and there was no way to hide a battle of this scale. It carved out an entire valley. And thus it would become known by all nations across the globe that tailed beasts can not only be controlled, but if they are controlled, the power wielded by them is godly. A power that only somebody like Hashirama would be able to battle against. And there was already countries making inroads at the possibility of controlling the powers of tailed beasts. And Sand and the first Kazekage had already captured Shukaku, and thus Hashirama, in the immediacy of defeating his best friend and killing him, realized, oh, I have a problem. See now, not only is there this raging entity that's in the land of fire that Madara brought here, but the rest of the world is about to realize that there's eight more of these things and try to use them against either us or each other. And thus when people try and figure out, oh, just why Hashirama went out and captured all the tailed beasts, it's this reason right here. Hashirama realized that weapons this powerful could tear asunder the newly formed nations. And thus Hashirama, in the aftermath of the battle against Madara, sealed Kurama inside of his wife Mito and Uzumaki. Well, 
Mito sealed Krama inside of herself, but you get it. And Tobirama hid away Madara's body to make sure that his body and his lineage wouldn't be revered as some kind of martyrdom to galvanize the Uchiha into a revolt. And after this, Hashirama lived in relative peace, presumably for another 10 to 15 years. During this time period, Hashirama helped Tobirama train one of his students in Hirazin, who would later become the third Hokage after Tobirama's death. He had at least one child with Mito, who eventually had a child, giving Hashirama a grandchild, who he got the spoil in Tsunade. And he sat down and wrote down all the dangerous Kinjutsu from the Warring States period into the Scroll of Seals. And by writing down all these Jutsu into the Scroll of Seals, he listed these dangerous Jutsu as Kinjutsu. Jutsu that would no longer be needed in this now era of peace. He then sealed away that Scroll of Seals in the Hokage residence so that only the Hokage would ever be able to access these dangerous and no longer useful Jutsu. But this peace after Madara's defeat did not last long, as other nations became increasingly jealous of the fact that he had access to the power of eight of the nine-tailed beasts and figured now that Madara was dead, Konoha was at its weakest and would become even weaker without Hashirama, which is why it's during this time period that it's assumed that the Land of Waterfalls sent Kakuzu to assassinate Hashirama. And it's at this point that Hashirama presumably puts the beating of a lifetime down on Kakuzu. However, even though Hashirama didn't decide to move against the Land of Waterfalls for trying to assassinate him, other wars began to break out between the newly founded nations. At this point that we realize that Hashirama's motivations have begun to change as he aged. See, the last thing that Madara says to Hashirama when he dies in Hashirama's arms is about how much Hashirama has changed since he was young. And this is fair because Madara's death is supposed to be a changing point in Hashirama's life. See, for the longest time, Hashirama was singularly motivated by two things, protecting his loved ones and his friends. However, when he became the Hokage of Konoha, that shifted slightly, as Hashirama's loved ones now became everybody who lived in Konoha, and thus Hashirama's goals now extended to much wider horizons than they ever had before. Which is why Hashirama is able to find it in himself to kill Madara, because while Hashirama during the Warring States period probably never would have been able to cross that line, because Hashirama now has so many things to care about, he is able to cross that line. And this is why Hashirama is so fervently anti-war, which is why when he sees skirmishes breaking out between countries, he calls the first ever Hokage Summit, and he pleads with all the other Kage to not go to war, using the tailed beast that he himself had acquired to try and pacify the other nations, hoping that balancing the power between all these nations would stop them from warring. But this didn't work because arming nations with incredibly powerful weapons doesn't pacify them. And Hashirama kind of understood that this was the case. As Hashirama feared after the first Kage summit that any peace that they would find would only be temporary and real peace wouldn't be found until further generations. And thus Hashirama's dream of peace between all nations doesn't come to fruition in his lifetime. However, that's not necessarily because his life is snuffed out early. See, Hashirama and conservative estimates existed as the Hokage for roughly 25 years, which is one of the longer tenures as a Hokage. In fact, as it currently stands, that would make him the second longest standing Hokage in Konoha's history and we can be fairly certain that Hashirama didn't die on the battlefield. As we know from when Hashirama is brought back to life by the likes of Orochimaru, he yells at Tobirama, telling him that before he died, he told Tobirama to not mistreat the Uchiha. Now, while this conversation could have absolutely happened on the battlefield, like Tobirama telling Hiruzen that he's going to be the third Hokage, this seems like a premeditated conversation, and therefore it's highly likely that Hashirama just kind of died one day, though it was during the First Great Shinobi World War, or during the lead up to it, somewhere in that time period. Thus, the story of Hashirama comes to an end. A man who accomplished everything but the one thing he wanted to accomplish. A man that created a system that would no longer need to use children as soldiers until it used children as soldiers. A man who wanted to protect his friend until he had to be the one to kill him. A man who wanted to protect all of his little brothers until he lost two of them in the Warring States period, and the last one only a few years after his own death. A man who seemingly accomplished everything. The founding of Konoha, the slaying of Madara, but ironically a man who was motivated by some of the most basic motivations one could imagine, and yet was unable to accomplish any of them. See, because that's the true beauty of Hashirama's story. It's not some story of power and prevailing. It's a story of laughing in the face of abject failure. Hashirama caught eight out of the nine-tailed beasts, gave them away just for them to be used against Konoha a couple of years later. Hashirama is more a story of changing in the face of failure and growing from it than the story of a genius who skipped his way through life. Objectively, Hashirama's story is one of the most tragic in the entirety of 
of Naruto. And yet, when he's talked about, he's revered as the god of Shinobi. When in actuality, between what he accomplished and what he wanted to accomplish, he's one of the most human characters in the Naruto timeline. And that's why I find him so complex, and that's why I adore him as a character. He is a sterling example of so long as you keep moving forward with a smile on your face and place in your heart for the people around you, regardless of where you trip up along your road, he'll always be revered as great, maybe even a god. And thus, now that you've heard the entire gospel of Hashirama in the way that it is supposed to be spoken, I hope you now know something about Hashirama. And if you feel as though you now appreciate Hashirama more as a character, or simply understand his motivations a teensy bit better, tell me about it in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Oh, I wanna scrub, I wanna scrub this skin off so bad. I hate the flaking period of tattoos.